1999, before cell phones, before Google, scary, before airport security lines were a thing. I was one of seven roommates from a Jesuit university in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who wanted nothing more than to escape the freezing Midwestern winter and go on an epic spring break before we graduated. During our final years of college, the group of us girls lived in an adjoining apartment on the third floor of a red brick building called Strack. People called us the Strack Girls. As in, did you hear the Strack Girls are getting a keg tonight? If you saw our living space, especially the side that I lived on, you'd understand why our parents would show up with bags of cleaning supplies whenever they visited. Our dishes would pile up to a literal tipping point. Our garbage would accumulate on the fire escape, making our place a prime hangout for possums. <laughs> our vacuum collected more dust than it ever consumed. But the Strack girls were busy. We didn't have time for that. I spent most of my non-class hours working at the student newspaper, hanging out with other journalism nerds in the basement of a 100-year-old building. And my roommates had their own things going on, playing on the women's rugby team, working at the coffee shop, prepping for law school. Though all of us were far more privileged than we realized at the time, we also didn't count ourselves among the rich kids at our school. We had jobs and budgets, and we didn't spend money on frivolous things like Windex, for example. <laughs> Perhaps that's why we were suckers for a vacation deal that seemed too good to be true. But also, we just really needed a vacation together. Because unlike the wealthy college roommates who wore J. Crew outfits and planned elaborate group getaways, my roommates and I had never been on a single trip altogether. Unless you count the time we ate all those mushrooms. <laughs> And our living room rug opened up a whole new dimension. <laughs> but considering we never even left the apartment, I don't think that trip counts. Sometime before Christmas break of senior year, one of my roommates spotted a magazine ad that promised round, trick, round trip tickets to Jamaica, transportation to Negril, and a hotel room for a whole week for about $600 a person. We were sold. Never mind that we had never heard of the company selling the vacation package or the name of the airline and had no way of investigating any part of the trip ahead of time. The important thing is everything that we did know, which were the lyrics to most of Bob Marley's songs. <laughs> also, we liked ganja. <laughs> and we desperately needed suntans. So we booked the trip and started counting down the days. It kept us going through a January blizzard that's still considered one of the worst in Wisconsin's history. As March approached, we heard about more and more people going to Jamaica, too. And when we walked into the international terminal at O'Hare Airport, it was clear that the trend extended to all universities in the Midwest. But my friends and I, we were different because most of the other kids were flying on some boring airline like Jamaica Air or Delta, whereas our airline was so unique that it didn't even have an, its own gate. <laughs> its name, Skytruck, was scrawled on a banner hanging over the Korean air sign. And it was right there that we, Skytruck's distinguished clientele, kicked off our trip, waiting out a six-hour delay on the floor with the other kids who were also not wearing J. Crew. But a delayed flight couldn't kill our excitement, nor were we concerned that when we finally boarded the plane, it resembled what we imagined the inside of a prison bus would look like. <laughs> we just wanted to make it to Jamaica, and that we did. Newspapers later reported that more than 20,000 other students arrived in Montego Bay that same day. And this was exciting. Also arriving was MTV which would be on site for its legendary spring break special. Maybe we would get to see Shaggy. <laughs> in the Jamaica airport, we headed straight to the bathrooms to change into our summer clothes. Vacation was on. And after finding our bus in the grill, a nice but stern Jamaican man gave us a lecture. The gist of it was something like, you are not in America anymore. Do not get arrested. Do not lose your passport. 
Do not go to Kingston. This is not a joke. But have fun, drink lots of rum, and every little thing is going to be all right. <laughs> the bus drove for a couple hours through lush mountain villages and stopped at a roadside stand so we could buy some snacks and beer. But as we neared our hotel, we began to realize that we weren't staying where the other kids were going. We weren't on the beach, and MTV was nowhere in sight. It appeared as if we would be experiencing a more rustic side of Jamaica. <laughs> our hotel was actually more what we know of as a motel. Uh, it wasn't a far walk from the Cliffs of Negril. That was the good news. The bad news was that our rooms didn't have enough pillows for all seven of us. Not that big of a deal. It also didn't have actual windows or running water. <laughs> A young Jamaican man named Anthony, who was related to the people who ran the hotel, said he'd be driving us around because it wasn't safe for a bunch of girls to take taxis. Apparently, Jamaica was experiencing a surge of homicides at that time, mostly gang stuff. We weren't worried, but we took his word, and Anthony became our lifeline that week. Back in our rooms, without running water, we converted our sinks and bathtubs into receptacles for red stripe and the little bit of ice that we could get our hands on. When we wanted to shower, which we only recall doing once or twice, we walked to an outdoor wood slatted area across the street. But like I said early, earlier, we were not fancy girls, and we really didn't care much about the lodging. What we did care about was the beach, and the beach was amazing. Anthony would drive us, and we'd hang out in the sun all day long, floating in the turquoise waters and buying delicious banana, banana rum drinks that doubled as lunch. <laughs> Early into the trip, a man selling excursions on the beach convinced us to sign up for a booze cruise slash cliff jumping trip. A safe pairing, I know. <laughs> this entailed drinking very strong Kool-Aid rum runners for an hour or two, swimming to a rocky shore in an extremely drunken state, jumping off 40-foot cliffs, then swimming back to the boat and drinking more rum runners until the sun fully set. You may think this is the part of the story where someone drowns, but thankfully, the only casualties of the booze cruise were my friend's nice camera, my shorts, and a bunch of other quasi-essential items that we realized we left on the boat as soon as it pulled away from the beach that night, never to be seen again. But after so many rum runners, who cares about losing a few things? Our only concern was finding food. We were starving. As we wandered around town, I managed to strike a creative bargain with a food cart operator for a whole jerk chicken and a massive bag of ganja. <laughs> I'm not sure how I did it. I'm not usually such a negotiator, but I have always had a penchant for talking to strangers, and it may have helped that I wasn't wearing pants. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our mission from that point on was to finish this beautiful bag of authentic, practically free Jamaican weed before our trip ended. But we did have a couple other pressing items on our to-do list. We were hoping to find some friends from school who'd be attending the Yellow Man concert the next day, and we absolutely had to locate the MTV beach party. In magical 1990s fashion, we managed to find the people we knew in a sea of thousands at the Yellow Man show with no help from electronic devices. We danced, drank more Red Stripe, heard about everyone else's luxurious, all-inclusive accommodations, and gained valuable intel about where the MTV party was happening. And the next day, that's straight where we headed after waking up and eating our usual nutritious breakfast of bananas and Cheez-Its. <laughs> <laughs> but as we exited Anthony's van at the MTV party, our stoner eyes were not prepared for what we would see. Spoiler alert, it wasn't shaggy. White cornrows were just the tip of the iceberg. There were wet t-shirt contests, aggro frat boys, group cunnilingus on top of a bar. It was, it was, a, it was a sight to see. <laughs> nakedness everywhere. Liquor being poured on the nakedness, groping and grinding, and all the Girls Gone Wild stuff that would no doubt turn up on MTV's Spring Break Uncensored special. Complete, tropical, questionably consensual chaos. We weren't prudes, but it was just gross. Recently, I was vividly reminded of the scene while watching a documentary about the attempted Woodstock revival held later the same year. Apparently, that was the vibe in 1999. 
My roommates and I tried to drink enough alcohol to make it all palatable, but ultimately we headed back to our hotel for the night. We had bags to pack and ganja to smoke. <laughs> our flight was leaving extremely early the next day, so we made the responsible decision to pull an all-nighter because we'll just sleep on the plane. But secretly, I think we were all ready to get back to school, or at least I was. The increasingly itchy sun poisoning rash covering every exposed inch of my body couldn't take another day. When our exhausted crew arrived at the crowded airport in Montego Bay the next morning, we learned some bad news. The one and only Skytrack flight was delayed indefinitely, possibly until the evening. After waiting around for a few hours with no updates, we decided to not be like the sea of other kids sleeping on the floor. We checked our bags with the airline and zombie walked to the taxi stand, heading to the closest cheap hotel. A lady at the airport gave us a number to call for flight updates, and two of my more well-rested roommates volunteered to take turns checking in with her. The rest of us laid like sardines on a king-size bed and fell into a deep slumber. We later ventured out for dinner, only to return to the hotel after being told the flight would likely not be leaving until sometime the next morning. We don't know where the plane is or when it will be here, the airport lady told us. <laughs> Just keep calling for updates. Thank you. So we kept calling until around 4 a.m. when my friend lost confidence in the information she was getting over the phone and feared the worst. We rushed to an eerily empty airport to discover that Skytrack left without us hours ago taking our luggage with it. We were out of money, hungover, and starting to realize there was zero chance we'd get back to our classes and jobs by Monday, maybe not even Tuesday. On a payphone outside the airport, we took turns frantically collect calling parents who showed mercy and helped us book egregiously expensive flights to Miami, which was the only way of getting back to the US that day. Touching down in Florida, we all felt a tinge of relief even though we didn't have our luggage and we had to wait another 12 hours for a connecting flight to Chicago. Inching through customs, our normally easygoing group devolved into warring factions. <laughs> <laughs> Whose idea was it to get the hotel room instead of waiting at the airport like normal people? <laughs> we have to try to fly standby to get home faster. No, let's stick with the flight we have and just kill time at the bar. This sucks, but we're technically still on vacation. <laughs> By Wednesday, after multiple flights, train rides, and carpools, we reunited with our lovely, dirty apartment, apartments in Milwaukee. We had missed days of class and had some massive new credit card bills to pay off. But our suntans, they were on point. <laughs> I retreated to the school newspaper office to write an impassioned editorial about how college kids are being duped by corrupt, spring break charter tours, <laughs> echoing what had become national news. Skytrack, with its refurbished charter planes, went out of business the next year. Whatever I wrote for the college paper surely had nothing to do with that, but the article did accomplish its intended job of convincing at least some of our professors to excuse our absences. And no, of course the article didn't make any mention of the fact that we missed our flight home due to a highly flawed napping strategy that I fully supported. <laughs> In the weeks that followed, any leftover roommate grudges from Jamaica peeled away like my sun-damaged skin. We graduated, we celebrated, we moved to all corners of the country, and we decided that our Jamaica trip was a little too disastrous and way too amazing to be our last. In the 23 years since then, my former roommates and I have reunited for trips to Seattle, Sonoma, Las Vegas, back to Miami, Palm Springs this fall. We've been in each other's weddings, helped each other through divorces, and have ridiculously disruptive text chains to share photos of the 17 kids we've created. <laughs> kids, I am so happy we'll have cell phones and the internet when they're old enough for their own irresponsible travels. <laughs> and when we need something to smile about or could just, have, could just use a reminder of how carefree we all once were, we can rely on evidence from the disposable cameras that somehow survived our very first adventure as the Strack Girls. <laughs> Kelly Quigley, ladies and gentlemen. Kelly Quigley.